Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello welcome back to NPTEL the national program on technology enhanced learning a joint venture by the Indian Institutes of Technology and the Indian Institute of Science. We have already um, uh, spoken about consumption in the last lecture and um, I had said that we would be discussing consumption uh, within cultural studies as it is um, studied under that rubric over two lectures. right? Uh, this is module 3 which is entitled sites and today we are in the ninth lecture in this module. As always let us do a recap of the last lecture. In the last lecture we found that according to uh, sociologists, according to cultural studies scholars, uh, consumption which is um, a part of our lives and which needs to be studied as a part of our cultural practices and forms um, was studied initially under uh, you know sociology uh, from the point of view of let us look at this slide here from the point of view of social deprivation, poverty and its consequences and policies on consumption to do with the alleviation of uh, uh, deprivation and poverty. Slowly we saw that uh, there was what uh, you know some critics term as a further sophistication or a refinement in the study of consumption where we find in a second phase um, there is a refinement in you know or you say more subtle um, propositions uh, on, uh, on consumption from the point of view of uh, terms like lifestyle, okay, like social position and at the same time there was empirical exploration of the phenomenon of consumption. Then we found that um, there was a cultural turn even after these first two phases, a cultural turn which was which um, had a multidisciplinary approach which was post utilitarian um, and which focus like most cultural analysis do on semiotic systems, okay, on the signs and signifying practices within, um, uh, within uh, the phenomenon of consumption. This was seen as related to postmodernism in which the analysis was not an analysis that you would find uh, from a Marxist perspective for instance with a clear um, onus on the political economy. It was more about the signifying practices, images, symbols, signs okay, to do with the consumption process and as it says here in this slide, the experiential, aesthetic and emotional aspects of consumption. Right? So, then we also found that Rola Barth talks about the function of objects even within consumption practices as related to semiotic systems. Well, we will now continue with uh, you know uh, our discussion on consumption, but in this second lecture on consumption the difference from the first lecture is this, the sense that we have dwelt upon the development of you know. Um, uh, theori uh, how theorizing has developed changed okay, over many years uh, as far as consumption studies is concerned. Uh, we also looked at what is entailed in the cultural you know theoretically what are the changes in the cultural studies exploration of consumption. And today we are going to look uh, in, a, in a bit to show you how this is done. Uh, and not to remain only at an uh, abstract or theoretical level. Today we are going to show you how one aspect that of consumption that is the process of eating out okay, which falls under uh, the general rubric of food studies. right? Uh, what uh, goes into this phenomenon called eating out? Is it some is it simply uh, you know a choice that we make of not eating in, in the house or uh, simply a choice or what goes into the choices 
okay, that we make as and what is the, the cultural experience, right? the aesthetic experience, even the political aspects of eating out. Right? So, we have a change in the text obviously here and the key source texts in this lecture are uh, Joan Finkelstein. Finkelstein is a very well known, very well known name in uh, food studies, particularly in you know uh, studying uh, as far as studying uh, eating out and the restaurant, um, restaurant uh, experience is concerned. Okay. Then we also refer to Gabriel and Lang's The Unmanageable Consumer and Ward and Martin's Eating Out, Social Differentiation, Consumption and Pleasure. Let me say uh, at the outset that even though these books are obviously, um, they look like uh, they are from sociology, but we will be looking at it from a cultural studies perspective. Fine. The first point that we would like to discuss and has been mentioned by the critics, uh, you know, uh, talking about the sociology of eating out, the cultural studies of eating out is this. Please look at this slide. The paradoxical nature of eating out as a cultural practice. Now, in, you know, if you look at, look at uh, you know in an, in an untheoretical untheorized sort of way at the practice of eating out you uh, one of the first things that comes to our mind is definitely this that eating out going to restaurants or eating in malls etc is a very pleasurable exercise okay as a practice as a cultural practice it is definitely one that is saturated okay or filled with pleasure otherwise why should one go uh, you know eat out at all, right? But um, this is how you go about theorizing uh, a seemingly simple practice like you know, uh, like eating out. We say that this phenomenon has a paradoxical aspect to it, or it is paradoxical in nature, right? One, of course. There is a sense of pleasure in it, you know, in eating out. And as I had said, why would we, uh, why would we go out? You know, why would we step out of our homes to eat if it didn't give us pleasure? There is a sense, definitely, we have of choice, right? We choose to eat out. A sense of power and even identity formation, right? The places where you choose to go to eat out. For instance, if you go to um, McDonald's or if you go to Domino's, for instance, right. So, you have a sense of, you know, um, uh, identity um, uh, being formed. You belong to a certain uh, group, social group, for instance, or if you are young, then you identify with all the young people that hang out in such, uh, you know, such places. Uh, where, okay, where, uh, of eating out, and there is also freedom that is performative. If you, uh, you know, if you if you um, observe people uh, in these area, in these places, you'll find that there is a certain performance that is being played out. One simply doesn't go and consume the food and come back. Okay, so this performance and this freedom is definitely related to identity formation, and as they want their identities to be. Uh, you know to be perceived by people okay people perform that act which they think is one of freedom and choice right in such places but we shall argue eventually that it is not as simple there is not a, a, a practice where you know it is completely willed by you or that you choose to make these performative acts so, what, is the, what does the paradox entail? The paradox entails this that there is along with these three things that we looked at, there is also an element of pretense, right. It is but natural that in this performance and freedom and the identity formation, there will de definitely, okay, will be an um, uh, because you perform, I mean, there is a performance element here, right. So, there will be a sense of pretense. Next, there is actually very fine, we will think one thinks that there is a sense of choice, right. There is actually a lack of choice and power. So, this is how critics say that at the same time as you feel that there is a sense of power and you know sense of uh, choice and freedom, actually there is also you know the opposite which is 
uh, a lack of choice, right? There is a pretense, and the performance is not one of performative freedom, but of simulated performance. Okay, so you see how um, right away I think we have already problematized this seemingly simple practice of eating out. From a cultural studies perspective, eating out as has been shown by scholars like Finkelstein and others, uh, it is a paradoxical exercise or it is rather paradoxical in nature. Well, so let us see what are uh, the areas okay, or, um, that or what are the what is entailed in a study in a cultural studies analysis of uh, of food and practices associated with food okay in a you know to 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 delineate the scope let's look at the slide the deli to delineate the scope we find that cultural studies and food uh, the you know it's a wide spectrum you know the scope is very wide and uh, unless you uh, are familiar with it one would be quite surprised as to how uh, an everyday practice like food like consumption etc okay how these can be theorized very richly okay from uh, you know from so many perspectives and of course a lot of uh, work and a lot of study and research has gone into exploring uh, food and and consumption from these perspectives for instance number 1 nationalism and diet is is one uh, you know um, how uh, identity formation as far as nationhood is concerned when nationalism is concerned is also related to practices of diet. Then globalization and multi cuisine with the coming in of globalization how you know um, uh, how uh, the uh, you know the variety the diversity uh, of food uh, food items has grown then food writing writing on food whether it is food journalism or books on food or travelogues based or focus around food right is also another area of study eating in and eating out and, and our uh, you know um, we have chosen eating out to give you an idea of how to theorize a food practice consumption and taste eating and identity body diet and health disorders anxieties and ethics like you know for bulimia for instance okay eating disorders anxieties and matters to do with etiquette and socializing okay so you see here there is a very rich right there is a very rich area uh, or there are very rich areas very you know potentially uh, you know very rich areas as far as studying cultural studies food from a cultural studies point is concerned Um, so, if A we found that uh, scholars like Finkelstein uh, and others point to the paradoxical nature okay, of eating out, okay. on the other hand there is also another aspect to it which is we one can do a cultural or several cultural analysis of an emerging habitus and this word habitus. Uh, you found or uh, we look had we had occasion to look at it in the last uh, lecture the part in part 1 of consumption and we find that there is an emerging habitus as far as cultural uh, you know uh, uh, of of food of eating out is concerned for instance there is this phenomenon called cultural omnivorism which has been um, sort of which has been um, um, identified so to speak by scholars okay and uh, there is, uh, they call it a post-traditionalist, um, you know, li you know, uh, change that is post-traditionalist in nature, in the sense that if you one is a cultural omnivore, right? What happens is obviously one has, have one leaves behind one's traditional diet, diet that is associated with class, diet that is associated with in India in with caste diet associated with one's even ethnic community for instance. Okay. So, one crosses these borders and barriers if I may use the word of food of consuming food uh, when one is uh, not simply eating in, but particularly it seems like when one is eating out then there is a tendency uh, in, in uh, people to break these barriers. Then it is also uh, you know, termed as a uh, 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 romantic 
turn and a postmodern turn in food practices. And finally, uh, cultural analysis of this new habitus is of you know concern with lifestyle and importantly the impulse of other directedness, which is also related as you will see to cultural omnivorism. Right? So, there is a, a lifestyle which is again it does not kind of implode into oneself, one is looking outward and trying to also you know um, if not appropriate at least experiment with the kind of lifestyle that is being led by people from outside one's community, caste or ethnic affiliation. So, this in, we use the word a certain adventurousness that is there which is of definitely a post traditionalist one, one that breaks away from tradition. So, you see how we can theorize or how people like or scholars like Finkelstein and others have very richly theorized uh, this area on food consumption uh, and eating out for instance okay, and have shown that how cultural new cultural orientations, new cultural practices for instance emerge which you call a, a habitus, a new habitus uh, emerges as you know uh, uh, identity formation practices shift as you know identity um, as uh, desiring certain identities also shift with the coming in of globalization right where there is adventure and adventurousness also in practices relating to food and consumption so i hope uh, we've been able to begin uh, you know to see how this theorizing of uh, food and eating out in particular is being done from a cultural studies perspective. Now, Gabriel and Lang in the unmanageable consumer, which is one also one of our source texts, okay, point to what we call the foodie okay, in our in general parlance and in you know in more formal terms we call the connoisseur. Right? So, uh, there is also the emerging personality or the emer emerging uh, you know uh, the, em the, uh, the emerging uh, persona so to speak of the foodie or the connoisseur right uh, with changes in, in, in cultural practices with, with eating out uh, for instance. One of the very clear examples, one of the very common and popular examples are these uh, f shows related to food uh, that you have on television nowadays okay, which are you know being hosted by these so called foodies and connoisseurs who give you it is not simply about food if you look at it carefully you will understand it is not simply about food, but it is to do with let us look at these points here. These are the points that are concerned with the foodie and the connoisseur. The connoisseur or the foodie therefore, is a chooser according to uh, cultural theory. He or she is a communicator of not just food, but also of culture uh, is an identity seeker, is an explorer in the sense uh, in which one can be an explorer of places. Okay? Uh, a foodie or a connoisseur is also an explorer of domains of food in different areas of the world, is also perhaps uh, you know a hedonist in the sense of wanting you know to, to both experience and experiment uh, with pleasure as far as food is concerned okay, is an artist at the same time if you look at definitely the paradoxical nature it may also be a victim uh, you know of his or her own enterprise is a rebel and is an activist and a citizen. So, well next time you look or you happen to come across such programs on television you look at it anew you look at the program anew and you look at the host or the the food connoisseur anew and you see in that persona so many different aspects. This is the way you one does a cultural studies or cult, you know cultural studies analysis uh, you know of, uh, of food and of uh, you know the representation of food in the media. Now, eating out therefore, is you know like many other cultural practices right uh, there are certain uh, kind of this uh, this are certain uh, relations or there are certain parallels we can draw with other kinds of cultural practices okay like many cultural practices therefore if you look at this slide here eating out the phenomenon of eating out 
is really these are structured events okay on many um, in many times these are also social occasions okay they are organized by rules so it is not this is where the you know paradox the or our realization of the paradoxical nature slowly begins to seep in right we had you know we said a while ago that normally people conceive of the whole uh, process and phenomenon of eating out as one that is imbued with power with identity formation one's will performance etc but slowly we see that these are also structured events right for instance they are organized they are also organized like other cultural events and practices uh, or you know practices to do with food and things like eating out or going out on an invitation uh, these are also organized by rules okay and what are these what are the you know um, delimitations these are to do with the time place the sequence of actions that are to be followed and the permitted combinations so like all social practices that are informed by rules by certain norms also the practice of eating out is informed and a very structured event okay then uh, scholars like finkelstein and others also say that well if you look at uh, you know uh, if you look at the uh, if, you, if you look at food practices in general they, we may divide them into a couple of aspects okay and the first aspect that uh, you know uh, is brought to us is the cognitive aspect now what is cognitive what does it mean when we say cognitive cognitive as you know is to do with attention is to do with memory uh, with perception and the like okay so to do also to do with food therefore there are cognitive aspects for instance uh, aspects of health right uh, there are uh, there are aspects of um, cal you know calorie consumption of vitamins and also in in food practice in general of the convenience of preparing food of you know of uh, you know of different ways of preparation of storage and av ability these are the cognitive aspects of food preparation then apart from the cognitive okay there are also the affective aspects right now it's not that affection or emotion is not to do with many scholars would certainly say that cognition perhaps also from a certain point of view also involves uh, affective aspects or aspects of emotions right so in this uh, however we may make a subtle differentiation in the sense that um, there are sensory aspects to it for instance food has to be found appetizing palatable tasteful and definitely we you know when when one goes or when one eats out these are some of the sensory delights that one looks uh, forward to or one at least uh, you know expects when one is being served outside the house these are that the food has to be appetizing palatable and tasteful along with the sensory elements are also the purely emotional aspects of eating out which is to do with friends memories okay uh, happy memories and being uh, of being with friends a feeling of conviviality right so we found that there are two uh, aspects to it we may divide them into cognitive aspects okay to do with uh, things like uh, our uh, our perception of health our perception of one's perception of health calories vitamins preparation storage etc and one's affective aspects like you know whether the food uh, or expectation of food particularly when being served outside the you know one's home is that food has to be palatable well prepared and to do with feelings emotions and memories then if we compare eating in and eating out as cultural practices or from a cultural studies perspective we find some interesting differences okay uh, as far as tradition is concerned as far as the breaking of taboos is concerned or the retaining of taboos uh, is concerned now in eating in we find that um, there is we may theorize it as a practice which maintains tradition right so there is um, you know uh, uh, households or communities have their own idea about what is good what good food is okay what clean food is and 
what healthy food is right so there is a, and accordingly there is a maintenance of tradition particularly as food practices being uh, the way they have been you know um, passed on from generation to generation then there is also a sense of, of stability of food choice one doesn't really uh, one it is expected that what one one there is a certain regularity look at the words here maintenance right stability so there is a also certain regularity if not predictability of food practices when one is eating in so what are the first two that we found maintenance of tradition stability of food choice third the reassuring boundaries between members of the household and others okay so look at the words here really maintenance stability reassuring then a retaining of identity and a reaffirmation of existing familial divisions of labor and power hierarchies okay so who is going to do the cooking who is going to do the washing and who is going to kind of uh, supervise the cooking for instance these are uh, you know uh, these are reaffirmed day in and day out as food is prepared and consumed inside the house okay so really if you look at all these words are to do with stability uh, are to do with you know a resistance to change as far as food practices um, uh, are concerned there is also a, a, you know an attempt if not you know a, a very overt one but it is understood that they, these are attempts at identity and identity retention these are attempts at you know reaffirming the, uh, the hitherto ex, you know existing hierarchies in, in uh, you know in, in a particular family that has been there for some time and uh, of division of labor within a family right so uh, uh, it's not that it is it is uh, something that does never changes in it is generally observed that division of labor for instance okay as far as food preparation is concerned is not really radically changed as far as eating in practices uh, you know is concerned next eating out so we looked at eating in now we look at eating out now eating out is usually perceived Okay, by cultural studies scholars and sociologists as um, hedonism or uncomplicated and immediate gratification. Right? One of this is one of the aspects. Okay? So, uh, it is not the not by only as you will see in a while it is not by only means the only aspect that leads one or kind of motivates one to eat outside the house, but definitely uh, an immediate and uncomplicated gratification of one's, one's culinary desires is something that uh, uh, eating out serves the purpose. Right? Second, there is also the convenience or release from drudgery. Definitely, there is uh, you know for the person in the in the household who is always responsible uh, for whether it is by supervision or whether it is you know by actually doing the work um, or in the kitchen. Uh, there is also you know an aspect in which there is a break in uh, the monotony and the break in the drudgery the release in you know a temporary release in the drudgery uh, of of the drudgery of being in the kitchen third it is a source it is considered in cultural studies a source of sophisticated pleasure for the discriminating palate okay so where on the one hand it may be an you know an act of simple gratification of one's culinary desires. Uh, in certain cases, this is also a practice uh, for you know practice in which one looks uh, at eating out as a source of great pleasure and discriminating pleasure. For instance, uh, discriminating in the sense of how well you can you know judge the food, uh, the ingredients that go in, 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 a, in into the into the preparation if it is something that is not within your usual daily uh, pattern of consumption if it is different how do you then derive a certain sophisticated pleasure uh, as you understand how a particular item has been prepared which you are not used to right so it is apart from straightforward hedonism and gratification for some people it is also an exercise you know also an, also an exercise of the palate that can discriminate among different kinds of tastes right then conviviality 
when one eats out and particularly uh, when we are talking about situations in which one is with family, sometimes with extended family and with at times also with friends. Okay? So, it is also uh, you know a platform or uh, it is also um, an arena for conviviality, conviviality of socializing and exchanging uh, you know um, pleasantries with one another. Then there is the overall experience of eating out. Right, the overall, as we said, the aesthetic, the cognitive, the emotional, the identity forming, the overall experience of eating out is the you know the general kind of general umbrella that is there, uh, and in in different situations, it, there may be difference in degrees, but generally, it's the whole experience of eating out that we are uh, supposed to look at, and it's, uh, and particularly various aspects. Okay, and the ambience. The ambience, the atmosphere of eating out is also one that is amenable to cultural studies, but especially the you know the way the restaurant is is laid out, the way it is built. It is it is a very rich text, if we might, I may use the word, a very rich text, um, uh, which tells you so much about the symbols. Okay, the signs and what they mean and how they relate to the actual practice of people eating in that restaurant. Okay. These are also very rich signification, processes of signification and signifying practices, uh, where a well trained cultural scholar can draw very rich inferences from even the ambience of a restaurant. Okay. And of course, finally, variety. Right, variety is also, the, uh, the, uh, also another variable in these um, as we study. Uh, the processes of eating out. So, let me quickly summarize okay, where in the case of eating in right in the in cases of eating in what did we see? We saw that there was um, you know uh, whether you do it overtly or you do uh, do not realize that you are doing it there is definitely you know it is a more tradition based exercise in uh, in the sense or uh, even if the tradition of a particular household even if it is a kind of nuclear family right so traditions are maintained boundaries are maintained work divisions division of labor is maintained okay and um, um, bo borders of boundaries regarding um, one's a community caste a class um, etc are usually retained and reaffirmed in everyday practices of eating in on the other hand, as far as eating out is concerned, it is considered a more exploratory, right, a more adventurous exercise, where, uh, and we, as we said, it, uh, it's, it's considered a post-traditionalist exercise, where the uh, where traditions are sometimes deliberately broken. Okay, taboos also are deliberately broken, and it is seen not simply as you know. Um, regular routine based exercise as one eats, it is also seen as a, um, as a scene uh, you know a scene of or um, a platform for conviviality as one eats out with friends and family. And also uh, you know uh, the entire experience of eating out is also considered different okay, as the variables are different, okay, different from the phenomenon of eating in. So, you see how so, you know seemingly um, practices that seemingly are not nothing to do with academic study for instance. Once they come into the purview of cultural studies and other kindred domains like sociology, anthropology etcetera, they offer a very rich interpretation and analysis of our everyday practices. Right? Now, um, I will uh, make uh, go into you know go to show you how uh, scholars have tried to differentiate between you know the the you know, the whole as aspect of eating out really unless one is eating out on one's own is, is definitely you will agree a social practice okay so social dining in pre modern times was slightly different from uh, in that that we find in the modern times okay so as uh, scholars like Finkelstein and others have have pointed out. Um, in pre-modern times, definitely there was a relatively underdeveloped market, and social obligations were, um, uh, you know, uh, were very strong, and the tra transactions were non-commercial, hugely or to a large extent non-commercial in nature, with with, 
you know the realities of an underdeveloped market. There was a great importance on hospitality, on gifts and feasts, the sharing of food surpluses within members of a community. There was a virtual guarantee of food. Okay, and the food practices were also, and particularly eating out, was also an expression of social solidarity. Okay. So, these are the points, okay, underdeveloped market, non-commercial uh, nature of the transactions, the importance on feasts and gifts, uh, sharing, um, guarantee of food, okay, expression of solidarity, these are the hallmarks of uh, social dining okay, or what we call eating out in, in pre-modern times and we shall see how these are different from uh, from the modern times. So, uh, again the, there was these uh, more again importantly in pre modern times uh, it was a reciprocal obligation and they are uh, you know uh, ma it marked the, uh, the rites of passage uh, as they are observed in different communities and cultures. But now we shall see that with the rise of the market okay, something else happens with the rise of the market uh, there is more individualism coming in. Right? And there is also the breakdown of kinship obligations as families begin to break out of uh, you know the joint family system when, and they have their own nuclear uh, um, families, okay? uh, the growth of urbanization, there is a breakdown of kinship obligations, there is also increase in travel and with travel also there is also the increase in coffee houses. Okay? Uh, importantly, if you compare this to pre-modern times, it is very important to note that coffee houses uh, came about and when we, when we do social history we find that the coffee houses came about in say 18th century, um, late 17th century, 18th century England, okay, uh, where we find even till today that there is a, it's an anti, it is an establishment that is anti hierarchical in, in uh, you know in location and also anti hierarchical in practice. For instance, anyone can go into a coffee house. Coffee houses are also you know they are not, uh, you do not expect huge feasts in coffee houses. Co coffee houses are areas or uh, places you go to for a short duration, for a short exchange of conviviality, for a short exchange of discussion for instance or part, um, short, short uh, duration of you know participating in discussions. And uh, it, the coffee house really is such an important marker uh, you know we, that we find as we move from pre-modern times to, uh, to modern times. And also, uh, where in the modern times there was this great you know, uh, it was a great obligation or a great um, uh, transaction of, 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 uh, say of giving feasts for instance, of showing social solidarity uh, or even once probably once hi uh, hierarchy and of guarantee uh, of sharing of you know food uh, supplies uh, among members of community. We find here that uh, eating out also uh, as becomes an act of necessity than only being an act of pleasure as we move on to modern times. So, these are the things that one needs to look not only at uh, the, the experience of one um, you know of, the, of one or two events of uh, phenomena of, of eating out, but generally also the historical development and changes in the practices and what they signify. Okay, for since in pre-modern times you would see that signi uh, it, it would signify um, a feast would signify uh, social solidarity for instance, whereas today it may not do that all the time and it was a traditional exercise and it was one the where you know there was a marking of hierarchy. But today we find that uh, particularly in you know in um, the symbol or sign of the coffee house, the coffee house becomes a sign of anti uh, an anti hierarchical uh, you know grow or um, you know orientation in society. Then uh, the study of eating out really again as Finkelstein and others have pointed out. Uh, this kind of eating out as far as modern times is concerned is really a, you know it is a phenomenon that is uh, or an academic uh, the academic study of eating out is really uh, not one that has been done uh, you know for several uh, years 
but it is a recent phenomenon and early again like you know in the first lecture we saw that there are different phases of studying consumption. Here also in one consumption practice that is of eating out, uh, the early studies looked at nutritional aspects and they brought out market research reports and there were campaigning books also. So, the early phase looked at you know uh, these kind of studies which was um, uh, you know empirical in nature and which was utilitarian in nature. Now, if you look at Ward and Martin's book uh, in, the, in fact, the title of the book is eating out social differentiation consumption and pleasure. I am reading out from this and we, uh, we shall unpack it right. Eating out has serious implications for any comprehensive understanding of the nation's diet. Eating out throws into sharp relief narrow concerns with food as merely a means of subsistence for eating out seems to be expanding as a form of entertainment. This is important okay. Eating out seems to be expanding as a form of entertainment and a means to display taste, status and distinction. Also significant is the willingness of people to swap their private domestic food provisioning arrangements for commercial and communal alternatives. Okay. So, this becomes a very important word here okay, for where the commercial aspect is, is, um, uh, is foregrounded in uh, contemporary uh, practices of eating out and what Ward and Martins have referred to is um, you know eating uh, eating out is definitely not just one of necessity as you know uh, as one one is in a nuclear family and one you know um, uh, one eats more frequently outside. It really involves so much more than that in the sense that it is also means to display taste. Look uh, remember the foodie or the connoisseur who can uh, you know who has a discriminating palate and can uh, you know and and can give so many you know, uh, so many pronouncements and judgments on on food of different on the food of different cultures. Uh, therefore, it is eating out is sim, is also a symbolic practice. Okay, this is a point that we need to look at very carefully if you are doing a cultural studies perspective of eating out. Eating out is uh, an act and also involves acts of identity formation. Okay, uh, uh, it also involves acts of displaying one's taste okay, status and distinction words that we found in the first uh, lecture was coming from scholars and sociologists like Bordeaux etcetera okay, the forming of member and emerging habitus a new emerging habitus. Where one of the most important differences is the commercial aspect. Now again as Finkelstein and others uh, have point, uh, pointed out. I am quoting food made available for money from commercial outlets such as shops, takeaways, fast food and other restaurants has been identified as a particularly 20th century revolution in our eating habits. Okay. So, uh, if you look at the you know if I may use the word the grandiosity, okay, the grandiosity of, of uh, social dining uh, in the pre-modern times. Okay. Uh, the in modern times of course, we have social dining as uh, you know um, as a platform for the display of uh, display of social status of the display of taste distinction etcetera, but as an important corollary and running parallelly to this is also you know as we first we saw the coffee house member where you know uh, where it is not necessary that one uh, that it is a it is an environment for display okay it is more an environment for you know food for thought really okay uh, also the other um, if that was an, a, a phenomenon phenomenon beginning in the 18th century today in the 20th century the important places for eating out are, are things like the takeaways as it says here the commercial outlets such as shops takeaways fast food and other restaurants where we you get quick food right so this is a cultural practice which is um, which is definitely a 20th century practice, a 21st century practice and is a recent addition to food studies. Okay. 
Now, the next term and this is a term that you I am sure many of you have come across is McDonaldization and McDonaldization uh, of course, refers to McDonald's the very popular um, you know food outlet which you will find in, in, in so many parts of the world. Okay. So, uh, scholars too it is not just the media, but scholars too have uh, you know uh, used this term McDonaldization to make some very important theoretical pronouncements okay, on, um, on food practices. For instance, McDonaldization as a cultural studies person or as a um, as a sociologist would put it involves okay, you can theorize it using terms like formal rationality. Okay. Formal rationality there is a very efficient scientific almost almost a scientific management of uh, these kind of you know uh, food outlets like um, for instance uh, Domino's or, or McDonald's and uh, KFC for instance. Okay. So, there is a, a formal rationality to it, so scientific management it is almost assembly line uh, it is almost done in an assembly line format. Okay. The work performed there by people is almost on an assembly line format of mass production available in shopping centers and also um, with such you know sort of hyper efficient okay, management and such great formal rationality you know behind it. There is also a certain predictability. The predictability not only as you watch the, the workforce in such outlets, but there is also a predictability as far as the food that is doled out is concerned. So, you see again as I said uh, these seemingly simple things like going out to eat in such pla you know places okay, uh, involves uh, a, a totally different orientation as far as you know particularly when you compare it even to coffee houses or even to the pre modern times okay, where there is a hyper scientific management and assembly and then and a resultant predictability to it. So, the sites of such places in the 20th and 21st century are sports stadiums, health clubs, airports, bus and railway stations, museums and galleries, bookshops, supermarkets, cinema halls and malls. And all these places you will notice one thing in common here is that you are not expected you know to, to, to spend much time in these places whether they you know um, eateries in museums, bookshops or cinema halls, supermarkets etcetera. Okay. Eating places, places for eating out that are attached to these places are always to do with also to do with you know uh, do with speed to this uh, you know as as speed as a hallmark of the modern times. Okay. So, you see as um, uh, as economies change as economics open out economies open out okay, as it becomes more globalized there is diversity and variation everywhere it also affects the processes of food consumption and of particular practices like eating out. Okay. Therefore, the restaurant experience as Finkelstein and others have pointed out is a whole consumption package. Right. So, we will we'll come coming to we are coming to the close of this lecture and we would like to wind up by saying that the entire restaurant experience is a one which entails a variety of pleasures okay. and with themed restaurants we also have uh, occasion to you know uh, to, to experience a certain theme or have certain themed experiences right. And also it is a multi sensory experience of taste, sight, sound, smell and touch. It is not to say that taste, sight, sound, smell and touch are not part of eating in inside the household, but uh, importantly these are far more heightened in the restaurant experience. Therefore, let me uh, quote from Finkelstein the modern restaurant designs its decor service and atmosphere in such a way as to relieve the customer of the responsibility to shape sociality. Why? Because it is already you know it is already there for you the template is already there you do not have to work to, uh, for it. It encourages simulated rather than general social engagement and there is an obligation again as I, we have come across this word before to give a performance according to the normative demand of the circumstances. Therefore, if you thought that eating out is a 
you know eating out or eating in restaurants is an act of uh, performance involving power choice Finkelstein and others would say no because why because the format is already laid out so you may simply you may not even be genuine in you know where you are actually you think you are being convivial you need not be genuine because the circumstances determine so to speak uh, the performance which you think that you are making or doing with so much of freedom right. So, let us come to the discussion and we will quickly look at one or two questions. For instance, why is eating out considered a paradoxical practice? Eating out is considered paradoxical because it involves both pleasure, a sense of choice and power and performance and at the same time it involves pretense and where there is actually we may argue a lack of choice and power since the performance is a simulated and a simulated one where the parameters are being drawn by people uh, by other people and not by yourself. Then what aspects of food are considered under cultural studies? The aspects of food in cultural studies in a general sense may be nationalism and diet, globalization and multi cuisine, food writing, eating in and eating out which was our you know uh, concern today, Con general theories and consumption and taste, eating and identity, identity formation, identity uh, uh, you know retaining, body diet and health disorders a very important aspect here disorders like bulimia for instance, anxiety is to do with eating and diet and health and ethics and etiquette and socializing. Then what are the differentiating cultural aspects of eating in and eating out? We found that eating in is a traditionalist exercise where we go on to the maintenance of tradition, maintenance of practices, of hierarchies, of power, of division of labor on the reassuring okay, practices which are reassuring by the sheer uh, uh, replica replicability and the sheer repeat uh, uh, repeatedness whereas eating out is also concerned with both you know immediate gratification as well as sophisticated pleasure from from foodies or connoisseurs okay it is also seen as uh, however controlled by somebody else a scene of conviviality of performance of exchange of experience and ambience again however the paradox being how it is also being created by somebody else uh, and of variety and definitely a release from drudgery from in uh, you know from the eating in framework okay of drudgery for those who are in charge of uh, you know giving food to the family members okay so well uh, thank you for being here and i hope you know i've been able to show you how uh, you know eating a practice like eating out of your house uh, is so infused uh, or it's infused with so much uh, you know so so many aspects to do with uh, you know aspects of power okay of pleasure uh, of uh, you know um, of signs symbols right of constructedness when the eating out uh, you know process phenomena phenomenon sorry is one that has been constructed within which we try to um, you know exercise our power in however paradoxical a way in uh, uh, you know in a, another very important aspect of cultural studies of identity identity formation ident and identity and playing out a performance of one's identity. Well, thank you so much and I shall meet you for you know in the last uh, you know in the last lecture of this module uh, like uh, which I uh, which is devoted to biology in the sense that we are trying to now uh, wrap up um, you know um, uh, module 3 which is devoted to science. We began with the body and we are also going to end with a similar topic which is biology. Thank you so much.